This week on the Laura Flanders Show, making sense of the election season with a historian. Eric Foner is my guest, and I'll be talking a little about a hundred-year-old proclamation that's worth taking a new look at. That's all coming up right here on the Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Stay tuned. Eric Foner is DeWitt Clinton Professor of History at Columbia University here in New York. He's one of this country's most prominent historians and the foremost expert on the Civil War and Reconstruction eras. He's the author of more than 20 books, including classics such as Free Soil, Free Labor, Free Men, The Ideology of the Republican Party Before the Civil War, Nothing But Freedom, Emancipation and Its Legacy, and Reconstruction, America's Unfinished Revolution. 1863 to 77. His most recent book is Gateway to Freedom, The Hidden History of the Underground Railroad. I'm very glad to welcome Eric Foner back to the program. Hi, Eric. Nice to see you, Laura. Good to see you, too. So, I mean, just in very broad strokes, how do you, as a historian, approach the election season? I think I've seen all this before. Uh, it, it does seem like there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, sometimes people who don't have a long sense of history wonder whether people have denounced each other vitriolically, as we have seen a lot this campaign season. Yeah. Yes, they did in the past. I mean, you should see what they said about George Washington <laughs> in the 1790s or Abraham Lincoln. Um, uh, the intensity on some of the some of what seemed to be the more r retrograde ideas that we've heard, like you know kicking millions of immigrants out of the country, things like that, or the anti-Muslim sentiments. Uh, there were parallels for that. We had a party called the Know Nothings back in the 1850s, which wanted to cut off immigration, keep Irish out, very anti-Catholic. What happened to them? I want some good news. Uh, they kind of faded away, although that impulse of hostility to those who are different yeah. and hostility to newcomers who seem to be different uh, has surfaced many times in American history. It's not just in the last year. Um, so yes, of course, today it's a little different than in the past. The media, the, the social media, the internet, everything everything anyone says is broadcast around the world immediately. So there's no uh, hiatus, there's no ability to take back what you said. And the other big thrust of this election um, and a lot of elections is who's going to get things done, to which I always say, what things? Well, um, yes, it, it, getting the, the ability to get things done is not necessarily that great a virtue if you have no idea what you're trying to do. <laughs> And um, I, um, you know, I tend to, uh, there's a, one of my famous quote, favorite quotes I give to my students about all this is from Max Weber, a famous essay of his, Politics as Vocation, where he said, what is possible would never be achieved if some people didn't ask for the impossible. Mm. The people who demand the impossible don't get it done, but they make the possible possible. They change the discourse. They put the issues on the national agenda. Uh, the abolitionists, for example, they didn't abolish slavery, but without them, slavery would never have been abolished. No, there weren't that many abolitionists no, in like the No, there were not that many, right? and they were pretty much despised in most uh, communities in the North, not to mention the South, for most of the period before the Civil War. And, and yet, yet they, they kept bringing forward those proposals, they those put bills. those issues, they changed the discourse which is a much more powerful thing to do than to get a single piece of legislation passed or something like so that. So when Hillary Clinton, as she did so much during primary season, goes after Bernie Sanders and says, you know, he may have ideas I like, but he's never going to get them done, what should be his comeback? What should well, have been his I comeback? think uh, Bernie should say, or others who know history would say, look, uh, things get done because of a combination of social movements and political leaders. You know, what was it, eight years ago, there was a controversy because uh, Bill Clinton, when Hillary was running against Obama in the primary, said, well, you know, Lyndon Johnson got the civil rights movement going, you know, and people said, well, wait a minute, what about all those people in the streets? It wasn't right. just Lyndon Johnson who did right. it all by himself. So, yeah, you can have a president who gets things done, but without ferment in the streets for change they're not going to know what ought to be done. That was part of um, the conversation we had recently, I had recently, lucky enough to have it, with Tony Kushner oh, sure. about the Lincoln movie. It's like, well, it did present Congress and the, and the way that legislation is crafted in an insightful way, but social movements were pretty out of it. 
Uh, well, that movie was what we call inside the Beltway. There were there were some very good qualities in it, the acting, etc. But as a view of the history, it was uh, claustrophobic. Yeah. Yes, there was no sense of the abolitionist movement. There was no sense of slaves themselves and their activism pushing the country toward the end of slavery. It was very much this Washington center. It took place in the White House or the House of Representatives. I mean, that's what they decided to do. Yeah. I'm not, you know, it's not a history tome, but it, it gave a miss, you know, it's part of the great emancipator idea. Lincoln freed the slaves. Yeah. In your latest book, in the book around the Underground Railroad, you talk about how few people were involved in that period. Uh, and then you go on, obviously, to talk about the work, the work that they did and its relevance today. Right. Well, of course, sort of everybody who has any interest in American history has kind of heard the phrase the Underground Railroad. Right. They may not exactly know what it is, but, you know, it's out there. But I think very often people have a considerably exaggerated sense of what it was. They think of a giant network of thousands of agents and Sometimes they take the railroad metaphor too literally. There were fixed routes and stations and agents and secret codes. No, it wasn't like that at all. It, was, it did exist and it did help thousands of slaves over the course of 30 years to get out of slavery into freedom, which is certainly a good thing. But it was local networks of very small numbers of people. My book focuses mostly on New York City. Mm -hmm. I don't think at any one time there were more than a dozen people in New York City actively engaged in helping fugitive slaves. Mm -hmm. There were those who occasionally did or on the street would meet someone and had, you know, send them to someone who could help them, but it was not a giant operation. And, um, and as I mentioned before, abolitionists, especially in New York, which is a pretty pro-slavery town at that time, uh, abolition, there were few abolitionists in New York and they were not really uh, very well regarded. And so here they had to operate, here in New York, they had to operate in secrecy and in great danger of people being seized on the streets and sent back to the South, which they were. Mm -hmm. And there were slave catchers on the streets of New York. So the Underground Railroad had to get people out of New York very fast. Mm -hmm. They couldn't hang around. They were in great danger. So I'm hearing a message here in a sense to those who are involved in social movements that may feel very small to them um, or separate from the national discourse. I mean, Black Lives Matter, for example, yeah. I'd love to get your feedback. Yeah. The expectation is that they will change national politics, have a national profile, be well, a national they, you organization know, they, they did. overnight. Black Lives Matter is very important. It's still going on. It reminds me, the very way they put the, the, the very idea of Black Lives Matter actually resonates back in American history. It resonates back to Martin Luther King's, the, you know, the, the Memphis sanitation strike where King was killed, you know, where the, the signs they, wrote, they wore were, I am a man. Right. They didn't say, give me 15% pay raise. They said, I am a man. We want dignity. We want respect. We want to be re our humanity to be recognized. Or go back 100 years or more before that to the abolitionist movement and their major kind of little, uh, uh, um, you know, insignia or a brand almost was a kneeling slave with words around him saying, am I not a man and a brother? Mm -hmm. In other words, they were demanding, recognize the humanity of the slave. Mm -hmm. Then you will turn against slavery. And Black Lives Matter is saying the same thing in a sense. Recognize the equal humanity of African-American people and then the police will not operate in the way they have, you know, in, our, in much of our history and even into today. So it's doing work no matter the size of the political organization. You know, it has candidates. affected policing in many, many parts yeah. of the country today. Uh, not that it's perfect by any means, but I think, I think because of Black Lives Matter, because of the light they have shown on this problem, because, unfortunately, of a series of deaths, unnecessary deaths of people, um, I think that cities, mayors, police chiefs are much more cognizant now mm -hmm. of the use of force, the trigger happiness of what seems to be quite common among police. And um, I think, you know, that's a significant change. Mm -hmm. It would not have happened if these people had not been out in the streets. One of the things that we're seeing also on campuses, but not just there, is a discussion about monuments, yes. about, you know, tributes to Confederate leaders or right. slave owners. Um, that that discussion and the decision to, to bring down the Confederate flag in lots of places, does that lead you to think we're in a different place when it comes to the way we're dealing with Well, you know, on the one hand, there are people who say, hey, this is just symbolism, man. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't mean a thing. They took down the Confederate flag in South Carolina, which they should have. It should not be flying in a public space, which is supposed to represent the entire state. Uh, and yet, you know, they won't extend Medicaid 
And there are deep racial inequalities still in South Carolina, obviously. Yeah. So it's symbolic. Symbolism is important. But on the other hand, you can't uh, have it for dinner, you know. And uh, so social... should you bring down the monuments on the campuses? Uh, it depends. They should in some cases. Uh, right. You know, look, I'm, in my campus, Columbia, luckily, was only built around 1900, the new campus. So we don't have any monuments of slave owners <laughs> or anything. Uh, I would... You know, it's not, I don't have a dog in this fight in a sense, but I would be in favor of changing the name, let's say, of Calhoun College at Yale. Why should Yale have a college named after the number one propagandist in the United States for slavery and racial inferiority before the Civil War? This would be like having a college named after Goebbels, the <laughs> propagandist of the Nazis. I don't think they have too many of them in Germany anymore. Um, taking down monuments, you know, basically, my approach on that is actually put up more monuments. Right. Look around the South. There are thousands of statues of Confederate generals and Confederate this, that, and the other thing. How many statues do you think there are of, let's say, black Reconstruction yeah. leaders? Not very many. Um, but that's part of Southern yeah. history, too. The, real, the point is monuments, flags, these are not just history. They are expressions of power. Who has the power to shape the public mm. representation of history. And if you look at the monument, the public monuments in the South, and in fact in the whole country, um, they show you that black people have never had yeah. much power in this country because well, there's not a heck of a lot of monuments to their contributions to our society. Brian Stevenson was on this program talking about his lynching project um, uh -huh. to have not monuments erected at lynching sites. They should to certainly tell that do other that to mark story. that history, absolutely. To go back to that period of reconstruction, what was the what was the idea uh, when it comes to power and how power would be righted? And, and how well, did that get Well, yeah, I mean, Reconstruction is a remarkable moment in our history. It's a, as Du Bois pointed out long ago in his great book, Black Reconstruction in America, it's a moment in the history of democracy. Not, it's not just a question of African American history, it's the history of democracy. Well, you always say that. You're not an African American yeah. historian. In the, yeah, in the United States and the world. Now, you don't have moments very often like that the end of the American Civil War, where an entire system is destroyed. Yeah. Slavery was a system of power, political power, economic power, social power, racial power. So the question of who's going to exercise power now is right on the front burner in 1865 and through Reconstruction. And it's not that black people suddenly took over all the power, but they gained a, a foothold in power. They gained the right to vote. They gained the right to hold office for the first time in American history, really, in any significant numbers. They held offices. They passed legislation. They helped to draft constitutions. To white people in a society that had been based on slavery for 250 years, this was intolerable. It was impossible to accept. And the you know, that power was met by other kinds mm. of power, particularly the power of terrorism, which we are very attuned to today, but certainly the Ku Klux Klan and groups like that, we had a lot of homegrown terrorism in our country in the Reconstruction period. And the power of the federal government, I mean, ultimately, after the Civil War, it's the federal government where power resides, and they imposed Reconstruction, but then later retreated from it. Mm. And once that happened, the power fell apart in the South. So yes, Reconstruction, among other things, is a very striking example of shifts of power and how and clashes of power uh, in the aftermath of this remarkable revolution of the destruction of slavery. Now, one of the things that was so rev so revolutionary and remarkable was the fa was the decision not to compensate the slave owners. Right. But there was not the decision to compensate the slaves, the enslaved people. Right. That uh, continues to resonate today. Well, it does, of course, and. Um, you know, the, same, the famous uh, phrase, 40 acres and a mule, the African-Americans demanded land. Or, or One historian once wrote, I think this is true, the political revolution went forward, but the right. economic revolution was much more, you know, was sort of stymied. Um, and yes, Lincoln, uh, although Lincoln actually <laughs> did favor giving some compensation mm -hmm. to the former s slave owners, Congress, the cabinet, they all rejected that. Um, the liquidation of that immense amount of property. Slaves were human beings, but they also were property, and they represented by far the largest concentration of property in the country, and that was just liquidated. Mm. No compensation, no payment, nothing. That's a pretty radical act. Mm. Um, almost all the other emancipations in the Western Hemisphere, the owners got compensation, not here. France and Haiti. Haiti, even Haiti had to pay reparations to France for 
over 100 years, you know, um, but uh, not here. So that is uh, that was a significant shift. So, but what happened then to that demand? I mean, you hear it discussed, Ta-Nehisi Coates' article about reparations got the kind of right. attention that it did because I think it's still such a potent demand. But what has happened to our to the connection between political power and economic power. Well, that's where Reconstruction is such a critical point also, because you, you might almost say that that's where those things went separated. Mm. That political equality went down one road, but economic equality did not. And so, the, in other words, the country adopted the idea that you can have political equality without economic mm. equality. But W. Du Bois, people like that kept on talking about oh, yeah. cooperation, Oh, the labor movement rejected that. The progressive movement insisted on what they called economic security, that you couldn't really have a democratic system with vast inequalities and many people lacking any economic security. FDR talked about this. That idea that you need an economic base. I mean, Roosevelt said at one point, you know, the the, using a word we don't use very much, the necessitous man, that is the person mm -hmm. who is needy, let's say, uh, is not free. It's not really free. You can have the right to vote. You're not a slave, but you're not free if you're economically dependent completely on someone else. Uh, so, yeah, Tanahishi Coates is right. This issue is out there. Mm -hmm. Uh, the only, my only question about this, the, the way reparations are sometimes discussed nowadays, now Reconstruction was 150 years ago, obviously, and no one's given out 40 acres of, uh, certainly in Manhattan, you're not getting 40 acres in a mule, forget about the mule, you know, <laughs> but um, sometimes the discussion of reparations, not in his writings, but a lot of people, tends to leave you with the impression that the problem was a problem of 150 mm. years ago. Th there are... Racism is being uh, implemented as we speak. Right. Uh, the face of racism today is not uh, a Klansman, really. It's not Bull Connor with his dogs. It's a banker in a three-piece suit at Wells Fargo Bank who is refusing to give, who is pushing blacks into subprime mortgages, which means they're going to lose their homes yeah. when whites don't. Um, you know, it's the governor of Michigan ignoring the fact that the largely black yeah. city of Flint is being poisoned by its own water supply so that the state can save a little bit of money. Um, so in other words, racism is, is part of our system even today. It is not just a question of reparations for something that happened in the past. We try on this program, and I hope we sometimes succeed, to not just lay out the problems but also suggest some solutions. In your work, you've touched on the utopian communities of, mm -hmm. of, the, of the 19th century and, and through to the early part mm -hmm. of the 20th century. Do you want to talk about some of those? I mean, you talked about 40 acres and a mule in <laughs> New York. We had black communities right. in Central Park and other places. We but, did. But what do we need to well, learn from that Well, you know, yeah, of course. Uh, the, uh, you know, Karl Marx once wrote, socialism began in America mm. in these utopian communities that were set up before the Civil War. These were... There, the, the idea was to change the society through example. In mm -hmm. other words, you, you create a model of a better society within the existing society. So it's not violent, you know, you know, it's not an uprising. You're just demonstrating the superiority of cooperation to competition. And whether it's the Shakers, the Mormons, uh, New Harmony, uh, Brook Farm, uh, you name it, Oneida, religious communities, the Rappites and others. There were, there were well over a hundred of these communities scattered around the United States in the period before the Civil War. What they had in common was they abolished private property. They saw private property as the root of inequality. And they, they, and they emphasized cooperative ownership and cooperative endeavor. They also, interestingly, very much tried to change gender relations, that the nuclear family is the real oppressive agent to women. So the Shakers just put the, 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 the two uh, sexes apart. Uh, Oneida, they had what they call complex marriage, which, or they were free love communities where you didn't have marriage at all and just it was individual decision making at any time. Uh, or, so in other words, the role of women was a major issue. And a lot of women joined these societies because they were fed up with their condition in the larger society. Um, and, and wanted a different kind of family system. And so, yet we're fighting like mad to keep a gender analysis in this discussion of new economic models and new societies absolutely. today. It's fallen away. Now, it needs to be said that these utopian communities were, well, 
utopian. <laughs> they were um, utopian, and, and they, and they, they, they you know, failed at the at the level of enduring forever. They they lost it for a good time. Right. The, most of them were pretty short lived. The ones that endured actually were the ones that were religiously based, mm. and usually it was the follower, the followers of a very charismatic and rather dictatorial often leader, whether it was John Humphrey Noyes in Oneida or the Mormons who went all the way out to Utah in order to set up so the... So what's the lesson of that? Uh, that's a good question. The lesson, the lesson, I think, is you can't build the new society as a little model within the existing society. You can't keep out the values of the larger society. They kept creeping in. Private property kept creeping creeping in, competition kept creeping in. Um, it's, you, can, you can retreat out, but that's not going to be a vehicle for changing everything. Mm. Um, that's why they're called utopian. They, they had this dream, and they did put forward alternative values. I mean, you know, in 1824 or 5, Robert Owen, the leading socialist thinker of the time, New Harmony. addressed Congress. He was invited to address Congress. We don't have a lot of socialists addressing Congress lately, but, you know, people were looking for, also, you know, uh, they were open to new ideas. Everybody will say, well, will Bernie Sanders address Congress? Well, maybe Bernie will have an opportunity to address Congress. <laughs> we will see. Thank you so much, Professor Foner. Great to have you. Okay, great to be here, Lorne. That was Eric Foner. You can get information about all of his many books, or at least some of them, at our website. We declare the right of the people to the ownership of the land and the unfettered control of our destinies. Sounds familiar? Well, it's not the U.S. Constitution. It's the proclamation that was signed by Irish rebels a hundred years ago this April. In 1916, a few thousand Irish men and women with pikes and poorly working rifles took over the center of the city of Dublin and declared a provisional government. Their republic, they said, would guarantee, quote, the right of the people of Ireland to the ownership of Ireland. And they pledged to, quote, pursue the happiness and prosperity of the whole all nation and all of its parts, cherishing all the children of the nation equally and oblivious of the differences carefully fostered by an alien government which has divided a minority from a majority. For a week, armed men and women and kids waged an insurrection against well-trained British troops. They failed, but the British firebombing of the city and the 16 executions that followed stoked enough anti-English feeling to kick off the process that got Britain kicked out of the lion's share of Ireland after seven centuries and inspired anti-imperialists throughout the 20th century, from Gandhi to Lenin. A hundred years on, the Irish may be at it again. Successive no-good governments have cut $30 billion from public spending, shredding the safety net and forcing 40% of children in Ireland to live in poverty. For each person taking up a job, two people of working age are immigrating. In response, activists are reclaiming that 1916 proclamation. A broad coalition convened by labor unions mostly has pledged to pursue a progressive set of rights, rights to water, jobs, decent work, housing, health, debt justice, education, democratic reform, national ownership of national resources. They're not armed with picks and rifles yet, but they're already inspiring anti-establishment feeling. The last election left Sinn Féin, the Republican Party that takes back to the rising, the largest opposition party in the South. So what's next? Who knows? But Irish eyes are worth watching. They're set on freedom, and not only freedom from the British, but from the entire global neoliberal empire. Watch out. To tell me what you think, write to me, Laura at lauraflanders.com. If you're buried in bad news and put off by partisan puff, you have come to the right place. For smarts, not sound bites, in-depth conversations with forward-thinking people, subscribe right now to The Laura Flanders Show, where all the people who say it can't be done take a backseat to the people who are doing it. Also available as a podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and wherever you get your podcasts. Join us. Today on The Laura Flanders Show, Brian Stevenson of the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama. So there was slavery all across the world, but in most countries, slavery was a transitional status. It could happen to anyone. It was not permanent. They were societies with slaves. America became something different. We became a slave society. Later in the show, we find out how your community can be part of his history marking project. Join us in this conversation so that we can move forward together. 
Can a socialist choose Hillary Clinton over Bernie Sanders? I talk with playwright and screenwriter Tony Kushner. There's one political party and then there's this incoherent, shrieking, <laughs> chaotic nightmare that, that the Reagan counter-revolution has spawned on the other side. And later in the show, I visit with an art gallery by, with, and for Roma people in Hungary. It embraces hip-hop and bell hooks. <laughs> <laughs> 